Okay, so uh, thank you very much, first of all, uh, to the organizers for organizing this wonderful conference for which they've put in a lot of work and for inviting me to speak here. Uh, so as, as uh, the introducer said, I'm going to talk to you today about the black hole information paradox. Uh, the black hole information paradox is one of the central areas of focus in the field of quantum gravity. It's also what I work on, and I'm going to try and introduce you to these ideas quickly in the next uh, few minutes. And to do that, I'll start by telling you a story about gravity. Okay. So this Okay, so the story actually starts uh, in school uh, when uh, we are first introduced to gravity through what is called the Newton's Law of Gravitation. So you know when I was uh, preparing this talk, all the organizers and everyone else uh, told me no equations at, at any cost, and I tried really hard, but I couldn't stop myself from putting at least one, and so this is one equation that you'll see. And what this equation tells us is that the force between two objects, like the sun and the earth, is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And this equation was formulated more than 300 years ago, and it's actually a remarkably successful equation because it explains you know, why the Earth goes around in the orbit that it does about the Sun. It explains why the Moon goes around in the orbit that it does about the Earth. It explains why the tides in the ocean nearby you know, behave the way they do. It explains why all of us are stuck to the ground and not floating up in the air. So it's really an equation that has served us well. Uh, but roughly about 100 years ago, you know, physicists realized there was something slightly funny about this equation. And to recognize that, you know, imagine that some very powerful extraterrestrial civilization or some huge natural phenomena came and moved the sun from its position. Okay? Uh, if it did that, the question is, how long would it take for the Earth to know that the sun had moved? So if you just think about this equation, you know, the instantaneous distance between the Earth and the Sun changes, and so you might imagine that the Earth knows about this instantaneously. But of course that was contradicts another principle that physicists discovered uh, in the early 20th century, which is that no information can propagate faster uh, than the speed of light. And this didn't seem consistent with that, and so in an attempt to make the theory of gravity consistent with this principle of relativity, this principle that nothing travels faster than the speed of light, physicists invented another theory. And there are many people who are associated with this, you know, Poincare, Lorentz, Einstein, Hilbert, Riemann, and many others. And what they said was that, you know, the correct way to think about gravity is not in terms of a force between two objects. Instead, what you should think of is that we all live in a fabric of space-time, the sun, by virtue of having mass, warps this fabric of space-time in a specific way. So the Earth also warps the fabric of space-time, but to a lesser extent. And the idea is that the Earth moves in an orbit around the sun, not because it's attracted by a force, but because these orbits are the natural trajectories to take in this warped space-time. So you see that, you know, from a philosophical point of view, this is a completely different perspective of gravity. From a quantitative point of view, this actually gives you results which are very similar to the Newtonian law. In fact, it took astronomers very accurate observations to determine that this theory was in fact superior uh, to the Newtonian theory, but it was superior, and so physicists adopted it. However, when they investigated the theory further, they found that there were other predictions of the theory. One of them, for example, was the prediction of, that there would be these objects that are called black holes. So black holes are roughly objects where you know, the mass that's causing this warping has become so dense that instead of a warp, it causes a tear in the fabric of space-time. Uh, you know, it's not so hard to understand this just using mundane concepts. Uh, if you wanted to shoot a rocket from the Earth um, up into space, you would have to shoot it at at least 11 kilometers a second uh, to make sure that it escapes the gravitational field of the Earth. Now, in the case of a black hole, the so-called escape velocity, which is 11 kilometers uh, a second for the Earth, uh, turns into the speed of light. And since, as I said, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, therefore nothing can escape a black hole once it enters the black hole. Okay. Uh, so when black holes were first discovered, people were not sure whether they were just a mathematical artifact of the theory or whether they really existed in the world. But more recently, you know, astronomers have actually managed to recognize and detect black holes in many parts of the universe. This, for example, is a picture of a black hole that sits in our own galaxy, in the center of our own galaxy in a place called Sagittarius A star, and this black hole is a monster. Okay, it's a monster because it's four million times as massive as the sun, and it just sits at the center of the galaxy and it gobbles up you know, more stars day by day. Uh, in fact, just last year, uh, physicists uh, using these giant detectors in the United States 
uh, for the first time also detected actually the ripples in the fabric of space-time that came about because of the collision of black holes in a distant galaxy. So now we have a fair amount of, of information and we've really actually seen a, a lot of evidence for the existence of black holes. Now at the same time that physicists were developing this theory of black holes, they were in parallel developing another theory which is called quantum mechanics. Uh, so the theory of black holes and of gravity applies to very large objects. You know, it applies to the Earth, to the Sun, to satellites, the galaxy, the entire cosmos. Uh, quantum mechanics applies at the other extremes. Uh, it applies to the theory of electrons, you know, atoms, protons, and very, very small objects. And in fact, the theory of quantum mechanics is something that has been tested even more accurately than the theory of gravity that I just described. So in the 70s, people started to ask what would happen if we apply the principles of quantum mechanics to the theory of black holes, if you try to combine uh, gravity and the theory of quantum mechanics, uh, what would happen? And they found some rather striking effects. In particular, uh, they found that when you consider quantum effects about a black hole, uh, a black hole is not entirely black. In fact, quantum effects start what one could call a quantum fire at the horizon of a black hole. So this is a very weak fire. You know, this is the kind of fire which if you and I were to pass through, we wouldn't even notice it. But it's there in principle, and the black hole smolders with this fire, with this very weak fire. And once again, you see that from an in principle point of view, this is a dramatic difference from the picture that we had earlier, because now black holes are not entirely black. You know, they instead have this fire at their surface that lives and that burns and that eats up the black hole slowly. In fact, physicists were also able to calculate the spectrum of this fire. So spectrum is actually just a fancy word for color, as many of you know. And in the 70s, many physicists, uh, most prominently the British physicist Stephen Hawking, uh, computed the color of this fire. And they found that this color obeyed a particular distribution, which is called the Planck distribution. Okay, it's, 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 a, it's some kind of a distribution. But there was something uh, funny about this distribution. You know, this, the color of this fire that burns at the surface of a black hole when you, when you include quantum effects, it didn't depend on what made up the black hole in the first place. It just depended on the mass of the black hole. So if you had a big black hole, you know, it would grow red, it would glow redder. And if you had a small black hole, it would be hotter and it would glow bluer. But all black holes of the same mass would have the same kind of fire surrounding them. And as I said, this fire would gradually eat up the entire black hole. So in principle, you could imagine the following kind of process. Okay? You take a star that's somewhat bigger than our sun, and uh, when the fires inside the star die out, it will spontaneously collapse under the force of gravity, and it'll form a black hole. When this black hole forms, these quantum effects become relevant, and they start a fire at the surface of this black hole, and gradually the black hole gets completely burnt up. You know, if it's a big black hole, you have to wait a long time for the black hole to burn up. Big black holes, because they're so big, last for a long time. But eventually, the fire eats them up completely. Okay. And then, what you're left with in the end is just some photons, which you know, were emitted by this fire, which obey some distribution, which obeys this, uh, this law that, that uh, you know, physicists found in the 70s. Now, you might say, what's the big deal about that? You know, fine, you form a black hole, the black hole burns up. But you know, there's something very unusual about this, and that is that this process, if it really were to be correct, uh, is in conflict with a very fundamental principle of physics, which is the principle of reversibility. You see, if, if I were to throw this clicker, I, I, I won't, but if I were to throw it somewhere in the audience, uh, you could use physics to predict exactly where it would land. But conversely, if one of you caught this clicker as it was falling down, and you noted down the position and velocity of the clicker as you caught it, you would be able to retrodict where it came from and who threw it. So the principle of reversibility is the idea, and this is true of all physical theories as they've been formulated so far, that given the state of the world at one point of time, you can determine not only the future, you can not only predict the future, you can also retrodict the past. And you see that in this diagram, it doesn't seem possible. Because on the right-hand side, you have these photons that were emitted by this quantum fire, but they only know about the mass of the black hole. Whereas on the left-hand side, you have this star, and the star could have had a lot of features. You know, it could have had solar storms, it could have had more carbon or more helium, you know, it could have contained entire planets, 
and all that information seems to have vanished in this picture. So this is the information paradox. It's the statement that when you put together you know, some well-tested results from gravity and quantum mechanics, you run into a contradiction with another very well-tested principle of physics, which is the principle of reversibility. Okay? Now, uh, this is something that's bothered uh, physicists for about four decades now. And uh, you know, many of us have been working, about, uh, working on this as well, uh, so including our group at Bangalore, and we've been working most closely with the group at CERN, including uh, Kiriakos Patrodimos, a scientist at CERN. And uh, we've uh, proposed a solution, which I'll now try and describe in the next few minutes. So, okay. so look, at, look at this figure. Okay? So imagine that this is, this is a black hole, and it's emitted photons of different colors. So if you just look at these dots, they're completely randomly placed, and they're, you know, they're random numbers of colors in them. So there's, there's a red, blue, purple, and yellow dot, and they're completely random, and each individual dot that doesn't contain any information. So if you looked at this figure, you might think that there's some black hole, it's emitted some random collection of photons, and this collection of photons doesn't have any information within it. But if you look more closely at this figure, you'll find something unusual about it. You see, if you take a red dot, say, say this dot here, and you draw the line to the black hole, and you extend it by exactly the same amount on the other side, you will find a blue dot. Okay? On the other hand, if you take, so that's this green line, if you take a, a yellow dot, and you draw the line to the black hole, and you extend it by exactly the same amount on the other side, you will find a purple dot. This is an example of what are called correlations in the data. So even though individual data points are random, they nevertheless contain correlations. So the collective of data points contains more information than the sum of the information in the individual data points. Uh, the correlations you see on the figure here are very simple correlations. They are what are called two-point correlations. And what we found was that if you looked closely at the photons that would be emitted by a black hole, in fact there would be very delicate correlations, much more delicate than what is shown in the screen. And these depth correlations could in fact preserve enough information to reconstruct what made up the black hole in the first place. So you would have to look at very delicate patterns. For an Earth-sized uh, black hole, you would have to look at patterns that involve 10 to the 66 photons, not two photons, as you see on the screen. But nevertheless, in principle, you know, because of the fact that correlations between different data points contain more information, the collective contains more information than the sum of the individuals, you would actually be able to preserve the information that went into the black hole. So the punchline is that by means of this mechanism, you preserve the principle of reversibility, which is very important for physics. But we also learn something else. You know, if you try to examine the physical origin of where these patterns uh, originate from, you find, in fact, that the nature of space-time itself has to be modified. So now, uh, this is a complex idea to explain, but roughly the idea is as follows. You know, when, when I talked about the fabric of fixed time, uh, something that's tacit in talking about the fabric is that one part of the fabric is independent of another part. You know, they can contain independent, uh, independent amounts of information. But it turns out that in this theory, if you look closely, in fact, there's a complex interdependence between different parts of the fabric. So let me try and explain a little bit what that is by means of a picture. So in fact, uh, this picture captures only some parts. You shouldn't push this picture too far. But one way to think of the interdependence I described is to think of the space as not being made of a continuous fabric, but rather by being made of threads of space-time. And these threads capture two features that are essential in the theory. One of them is that if you try and draw a circle somewhere here, then you see that the number of threads that cross the circle you know, depend on the perimeter of the circle. So in particular, if the atomic piece of information lived on one thread, then the amount of information you could put in the circle would be proportional not to its area, but to its perimeter. Secondly, if you're sitting somewhere on a circle and you had all the threads in your hand, then you would immediately know what was happening everywhere in the circle, even without going to the center of the circle. So this is an example of non-locality you know, that we talked about at the beginning. Now, of course, these effects are, are very delicate. You know, a, uh, a kind of number of threads that, in our theory, would cross a square meter of the fabric would be 10 to the 70. So to all approximations, it looks very much like a continuous fabric, 
But once again, from a philosophical point of view, you know, there's another paradigm shift. And you see that, that this paradigm shift kind of brings us halfway back to where we started from. You know, we started the Newtonian theory of gravitation, which was a theory that involved action at a distance. You know, it said, here's the sun, here's the earth, the sun attracts the earth at a distance, and so the earth moves around the sun. Then we said, oh, we don't like this non-local action at a distance, you know, because we don't like non-locality. And so we invented this fabric of space-time, and we said, look, the fabric responds to the mass of the sun, and the earth responds to the curvature of the fabric, and so it goes around in an orbit. And now we are coming halfway back to where we started from, because we are saying, if you look closely at this fabric, the fabric is not really continuous, but rather it's made of these non-local threads, and these threads are non-local extended objects, so it kind of brings us halfway back to where we started from in the Newtonian theory. And so it's yet another paradigm shift in the way we perceive space-time. Now I'm sure that some of you who are sitting in the audience were thinking, you know, this guy is telling us about philosophical paradigm shifts in the way we look at the universe, but how does it matter to me? You know, how, how does it make a difference in our daily lives? In fact, the frank answer to the question is it doesn't make a difference in your daily lives. And, and the reason for that is because these effects are so fine and they're so delicate that even experimentally verifying them is a tremendous challenge. So, and we are very far from mastering the level of technology that we require to actually make use of them. But even then, if you're the kind of person who cares a lot about technological applications, you should remember that history is firmly on your side. And that is because when these other theories that I described the theory of quantum mechanics or the theory of general relativity were developed, they were not developed with an eye to technological applications. They were developed purely out of a sense to try and understand our place in the universe. But today, everything, including this GPS watch I'm wearing, including the fact that this computer works, including the fact that this laser pointer works, depends in detail on these theories. If you were to go back even further and think of the theory of electromagnetism, you know, when uh, the well-known physicist Michael Faraday, who played an important part in developing electromagnetism, was once giving a lecture, you know, a lady came up to him and said, but Mr. Faraday, even if the effects that you have described are real, of what use are they to me? And uh, his answer was, uh, reportedly, uh, Madam, uh, when a baby is born, do you ask what use it is? And in fact, uh, his attitude was absolutely right, because today, if you look around you, the fact that the lights in this room work, the fact that your car battery works, the fact that we have electricity at all, is all due to the effects that Faraday discovered. So I'm actually going to end this talk with a challenge. And I hope that some of the, you know, some of the young students of science and technology who are present in the audience today will, in the not too distant future, quite way not only to contribute uh, to this theory theoretically and develop it more mathematically, but also find a way to test it experimentally and maybe even find a way to apply it to technology and perhaps and hopefully with the same kind of profound effects that electromagnetism and quantum mechanics and general relativity have had in our lives today. So I'll stop there. Thank you.